<laughs> Yay! <laughs> Just one second, hopefully. <laughs> so, oh, there we go. All right. One more? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, quick test. There we go. All right. It's been a little over 80 years since Robert H. Goddard first launched a liquid fuel rocket and gave us the technology we needed to go to space. And since then, we've sent people and probes and rovers and even space stations to the low Earth orbit, moon, Mars, and beyond. Most of those missions have happened through national space agencies. Our national space agency, NASA, was started in direct response to the world's first satellite, Sputnik. If you don't remember why we were so afraid of this little sphere of metal, keep in mind that it was launched by our then biggest enemy, the Soviet Union, aboard a modified intercontinental ballistic missile. And it orbited the Earth, transmitting cryptic radio signals that nobody could decipher. It threw America's vision of technological superiority out the window and started the greatest period of technological innovation that the world has ever known, the space race. The dream of putting a man on the moon inspired America. Congress began pouring funding into NASA missions, and the nation's top minds began competing for NASA jobs. And a focus on STEM education created an entire generation of scientists and engineers and space enthusiasts. The energy at NASA was so great during this time period that people would sleep overnight in their offices because they didn't want to miss the next big development. And it was because of this energy that NASA employees, by the time the Apollo missions had put 12 people on the moon, had been able to spin out over 1,000 technologies of things like 3D graphics engines that have completely revolutionized the world as we know it. But unfortunately, once the USSR collapsed, Congress began cutting NASA funding. And the results of this in the public imagination aren't pretty. This webcomic basically reads, we know that NASA didn't fake the moon landing because if they were willing to fake great accomplishments, they'd have a second one by now. Some critics have applauded Congress's decision to cut space funding. They say that we need to focus on the problems that we have down here on Earth before we focus on following our dreams and getting up there. But these people don't see the big picture. They don't see that the tech spin-offs have improved the quality of life on Earth, that the experiments and the missions that we've done have completely revolutionized and have the potential to revolutionize our understanding of things like physics and technology and how we build it and how we use it. They don't understand that we, as a species, will never rest until we have been everywhere and know everything. But thankfully, other people do see that picture. They see the benefits of space exploration. Some people have imagined it and written about it before we've even had the technology to go there. The first book about space exploration imagined launching explorers to the moon in a giant cannon. From the Earth to the Moon was written by Jules Verne in 1862. That was before the Wright brothers were even born. Some more contemporary champions of space exploration, like Arthur C. Clarke and Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson, have done things like performing research and writing more science fiction and doing PBS documentaries like Cosmos and have just done everything they can to explore and explain to the public why space exploration is necessary. And that's because they see the technology. They know it's feasible. They're not just dreaming anymore. They know the benefits. They talk about space exploration's transformative effect on science and industry and national defense. They talk about its potential future million and billion dollar industries like space tourism and asteroid mining. They talk about how we've run out of habitable frontiers here on Earth, but space, the final frontier, 
offers unlimited fresh starts and opportunities. They talk about how Earth's finite resources mean that one person's gain is another person's loss, but that the resources in space are so vast that it would take thousands of years just to exhaust what we have in our solar system. There's enough land, enough energy, enough water, enough space up there that we wouldn't have to fight over it. Things that start wars on Earth, things like territorial conflicts and disputes over energy, those won't be an issue once we get up there. And you might say to yourself, that seems a little unrealistic. How do we know for sure that space has the potential to improve humanity? And the answer is, it already has. This picture of Earth as the pale blue dot was taken by Voyager 1 in 1990 and was one of the key rallying points around the early environmentalist movement. It's among the most powerful and influential photographs in the history of photography because its basic message is clear. We are a tiny speck in the vast nothingness of space. And so far, there have been no hints that someone is out there to help save us from ourselves. It's forced us as a species to realize that the Earth will not last forever and that nobody but us is around to care. And it's been these stark realizations combined with an increase in consumer electronics that have inspired some individuals to step up and try and make space exploration a reality. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos have started SpaceX and Blue Origin, both of which are dedicated to reducing the cost of getting up there. Richard Branson, Branson has started Virgin Galactic to try and make space tourism a reality by using suborbital planes. Startups like Planet Labs and Skybox are revolutionizing the satellite imaging business using miniaturized satellites. Planetary Resources aims to be the first successful asteroid mining company in history. An organization that keeps track of companies in the commercial space sector, New Space Global, estimates that there are over 500 companies out there, and most of them have been started in the past five to 10 years. It's clear that the American space industry is moving towards a Silicon Valley mindset of making space open to anyone and everyone who wants to go there. And we're not the only ones interested in going to space. The European and Japanese space agencies are launching satellites and performing research. The Indian Space Agency is landing a rover on Mars in a couple of months. And the Chinese Space Agency just landed something on the moon. International missions and cooperations are becoming more and more common because for the first time in decades, it seems like space exploration is possible. Things that we've talked about for years and years and years in science fiction, things like moon bases and Mars colonies and deep space missions and space hotels, all of these things are looking more and more realistic and more and more feasible. But we're not quite there yet. The current cost to put one pound of material in orbit is 10 thousand dollars. We need to develop reusable rockets to reduce that cost significantly. We know that microgravity deconditions the bone and the muscles and the heart, but we don't know how or why or what we can do to stop it. Can you imagine the difficulties of treating a medical emergency, of performing surgery in zero gravity when you're floating sideways and gravity isn't holding the blood in the patient's body in? How can you protect yourself from solar and cosmic radiation when we don't have our atmosphere to protect us anymore? In order to get to Mars and to do deep space missions, we're probably going to have to build super ships, which means we're going to have to build it in orbit. But if you look at our current manufacturing systems, they don't work in zero gravity. And these are just the technical problems. What about the legal issues of having companies own asteroids, of selling products made in space? What about the political and cultural and social challenges of getting countries like America and China and India and Russia working together and agreeing on what the goals of space exploration should be? What about all of the other hundreds of challenges that we haven't even discovered are there yet? All of these things sound daunting. But putting a man on the moon made us realize that impossible is just another synonym for it requires more effort. And what does that mean daunting is? Doesn't that mean 
that a daunting challenge is something that you and I can help contribute and solve within our lifetimes? We know we want to go to space. We know we want to expand our presence up there. We know we want to conduct science and expand our knowledge, to gain access to the limitless resources that are available, to help change the status quo on Earth, to help humanity move towards its next chapter of evolution. All we need are the people to get us there. And that's where you and I and everybody in this room come in. Because we can do it within our lifetimes. And once we do it, once we get up there, I can promise that our world will never be the same. Thank you. <laughs>